The act of faith, O oh my God, I firmly believe, believe that thou, thou art one, one God and three divine persons, persons, the Father, the, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And I believe that thy divine Son became man and died for our sins, and that he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe these and all the truths which the Holy Catholic Church teaches, because thou hast revealed them, canst neither deceive nor be deceived. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, Seed of Wisdom, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. All right, please be seated. So I want to start today with a little programming note that unfortunately I'm traveling the next three Saturdays in a row, and Saturday's the only day I can do this. So our next class will be on March the 18th, four, four weeks from today. But after that, we should be able to get back onto our every other, every other Saturday. Uh, so first of all, a little review. Last week, we uh, were talking about who Jesus Christ is, and this idea that Jesus Christ this teaching of the church, this doctrine, that Jesus Christ is one person with two natures, the nature of God and the nature of man, but only one person. And of course, he came into the world, by that I mean that God the Son became man in order to die for us, to redeem us, to pay back, we could say, to the Heavenly Father, uh, to atone, for the sin of Adam and Eve, as well as actual sins. And uh, also, our Lord founded a church. And that's what I want to go into next class, next week. So, um, today, we want to talk about the Holy Ghost. Now, we say uh, in the Apostles' Creed that Jesus Christ uh, became man, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. So that's 40 days after Easter, after the resurrection, our Lord ascended into heaven, where he sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. So that's the, the first part of the Apostles' Creed on Jesus Christ. But then after that, after mentioning that, it says, I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, etc. Forgiveness of sins, resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. So today we want to talk about what do we mean and what, what, what all is entailed when we say, I believe in the Holy Ghost. So Jesus told his apostles that uh, before he died, before his passion and death, that he would send the Holy Ghost upon them, and that the Holy Ghost would come from the Father. He said on one occasion, whom the Father will send to you in my name, and on another occasion he's referred to the Holy Ghost, whom I will send. So we say the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son. And we know that we had a couple classes ago, actually our first class was on the Trinity, and what we understand about the three divine persons is that they are equal. So we name the Father first, and then the Son, and then the Holy Ghost, but that does not apply, uh, imply any inferiority on the part of the Holy Ghost, because all three persons are God, all three persons are, are equal, consubstantial, they have the same substance of the Godhead, they are eternal, etc. But the role, we could say, or what we, the work we attribute to the Holy Ghost is that of the sanctification of souls. So let's think about, we could say the Holy, we usually use the terminology the Holy Ghost, it's a little clearer, Holy Ghost, or you could say the Holy Spirit. Now, I typically don't use that when we talk about the Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit is fine. The only issue for me is that when Vatican II came, they really pushed the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And then, to my mind, 
they kind of change the meaning, like they have the spirit. Uh, but Holy Spirit is a perfectly orthodox translation of Spiritus Sanctus in Latin, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, the traditional Catholic uh, term that is used at least in prayers, the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost then is the third person of the Blessed Trinity, and at, after Jesus Christ ascended into heaven. So again, that was 40 days after his resurrection from the dead. We celebrate it every year on Ascension Thursday. It's always on a Thursday because our Lord did ascend into heaven on a Thursday, 40 days after his resurrection. Before he ascended, he told the apostles to remain in Jerusalem until they had received what he referred to as the promise of the Father, or the paraclete, the advocate, whom the Father would send them in his name. So they should wait there in Jerusalem until they had received the gifts of the Holy Ghost. Now, um, so our Lord ascended into heaven, told them to wait, and then ten days later, on Pentecost Sunday, so, so that's exactly seven weeks after Easter, 49 days, or we would say the 50th day, if you count Easter Sunday and then you count Pentecost Sunday, it's exactly 50 days. And the word Pentecost comes from a Greek word meaning 50. And Pentecost was a Jewish feast, which was actually the day before, on the Saturday, the Sabbath. And, of course, the Holy Ghost came on Sunday. But the purpose of that Jewish feast in the Old Testament was to commemorate the Ten Commandments being given to Moses on Mount Sinai. And that was after the Jewish people left with Moses. They left Egypt. They camped at the foot of this mountain, Mount Sinai. Moses went up on the mountain. A cloud came down on the mountain. There was thunder and lightning. And God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. So that event was commemorated every year by the Jewish people uh, as their second most important feast day, and that was Pentecost. Of course, the greatest was Passover being delivered where the angel of death passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt when the firstborn in the families of the Egyptians uh, was slain in each home of the Egyptians. And the angel of death passed over their houses. Fascinating Bible history. So our Lord ascended into heaven on a Thursday, Ascension Thursday, and then 10 days later, the Holy Ghost descended on the apostles. So we refer to that as Pentecost because that was the name of the feast to the Jewish people. Um, so the Holy Ghost, we will say, descended on the apostles and on our Blessed Mother and also many disciples that were gathered there. And this happened... Uh, on Sunday morning, the day after the actual Feast of Pentecost for the Jews, which was the Saturday, Sunday morning at 9 o'clock, the third hour of the day, it says in Scripture, which was would be our 9 o'clock, so roughly 9 o'clock. And what happened is the apostles and disciples were gathered in the upper room where our Lord had had the Last Supper. And all of a sudden, the house was shaking as though a violent wind was coming or, or was shaking the house. And all of a the sudden there appeared over them little tongues of fire, it says, little uh, flames of fire appeared over the heads of each of them and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and they became completely transformed. Before that, the apostles were very fearful. They were timid. They were afraid of being put to death. Remember that when our Lord was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, they all fled. They ran away. And after his passion and death, they had the door to the, the doors to this room where the, the Last Supper was and where they would assemble. The doors were barred shut because they were afraid someone would come. And our Lord appeared to them 
the evening of his resurrection just came through the door because the doors were barred shut. So they were, they were fearful, they were timid, they were weak, they were unlettered. But when they received the Holy Ghost at Pentecost, they were completely transformed. And they went forth out of the house. Now, a lot of people had gathered there because um, the sound of the wind. They thought, what's going on in that quarter of the city? So a lot of people gathered there to see what they heard, this commotion, this large, this you know tremendous wind, but wasn't anywhere else in the city. So they went to that part of the city. The apostles came out, and they began to preach. And in particular, St. Peter, the chief of the apostles, preached his first sermon. And it was so powerful that 3,000 persons were baptized that day. We call that the birthday of the church. Uh, what is particularly interesting is that the apostles were speaking in their own language, which we would call Aramaic, and these people could all understand as though they were speaking in their individual languages. Now, it says in Scripture that there were people there from every nation under heaven. Why so many different nations? Because the Jewish people had the custom, if you could, of traveling to Jerusalem for the major feast days, those who could. And there were people from as far away as Rome, from else, in, in days when you had to walk by foot or take a lengthy uh, journey by ship, etc. And these Israelites had been scattered. There were various events in their history, such as the Assyrian captivity, then the Babylonian captivity, etc., which are usually referred to as the diaspora. And if you ever hear that term, it, it means the diaspora means the dispersion. So the Jewish people had been dispersed to many different countries. Now imagine, uh, even with the Babylonian captivity, which happened around 588 BC, after 70 years, they were allowed to return to Jerusalem. But many of them chose not to. They had a home. They didn't even know the, the language anymore the Hebrew language, they, they had grown up there, they were born there, they, they had, you might say, put down roots in Babylon. So uh, they stayed there, but they were still practicing their religion. They still kept alive the whole promise of the Messiah and so forth. So they would go back to Jerusalem, if they could, for these different feast days. And so there happened to be a large number of pilgrims in Jerusalem when the Holy Ghost descended on the Apostles on the Sunday which we call Pentecost Sunday seven weeks after Easter and again as I said they they gave the sermon all the people could understand and then many of them were baptized 3,000 the next day another 2,000 were added so the church began to grow and to spread well what happened with these people they went back to the countries where they were from, they told others about their faith that now the Messiah had come, his name was Jesus, and so forth. And then when the apostles went into those lands, they found there Christians who had been baptized or had received the faith at the time of Pentecost. So it was truly the birthday of the church. So we want to talk about the Holy Ghost and what he does for souls, because again, the Holy Ghost is the sanctifier. So, when we were baptized, think of what baptism does. So, we know that, number one, it cleanses the soul of original sin. So, it takes away original sin from the soul. In place of that original sin, the soul receives sanctifying grace. And I'm going to particularly talk about that in, in a few minutes, what do we mean by sanctifying grace, etc. So the soul, even a, a beautiful baby that's born, does not have the life of God within, within its soul. Because of original sin, we're all born with that stain of original sin on our soul. And that sin is washed away, it's taken away from the soul through baptism. And it's replaced with the life of sanctifying grace, which is a share in the life of God. But in addition to sanctifying grace, 
the soul becomes a temple of the Holy Ghost. So we could say that the Holy Ghost takes up his residence through grace in the soul of the person baptized. And he brings with him not only sanctifying grace, but also his gifts, what we call the gifts of the Holy Ghost, and also the infused theological virtues. So I want to talk about these things, and uh, they help us to understand what a beautiful thing baptism is, what an important thing is sanctifying grace, because it's, it's one or the other. Either any given soul in the world today is in the state of sanctifying grace, or is not. And our purpose in life, you could say, is once we have received the life of sanctifying grace, to hold on to it, to avoid losing it through the only way it could be lost is committing a mortal sin, uh, avoiding the occasions of sin, maintaining a good Catholic life. Because that, that treasure of sanctifying grace is dearer to us than life. And when we die, at the moment of our death, our eternity will be dependent on one thing. Is the life of sanctifying grace in this soul or not? So those who die in the state of sanctifying grace will go to heaven. They may have to go to purgatory first, even for a lengthy time, but they have saved their souls. They will go to heaven. Those who die without the state of sanctifying grace, meaning they're in the state of mortal sin, because it's one or the other, they will go to hell. And there's no changing that, because the moment of death, uh, the, the soul is fixed. The state of the soul is fixed for eternity. So, so this is really very important. So let's talk about grace. First of all, what do we mean by grace in general? Grace is defined by the Catechism as a supernatural gift from God given to us for our salvation. Grace is something spiritual. It's a, uh, it's a reality, but it's not material. You can't feel it or taste it or see it. it, it, it grace is something invisible. It is a supernatural gift from God. It's a help from God given to us to help us get to heaven. So it has as its purpose to lead souls to heaven. And there are two kinds of grace. Grace is either sanctifying or actual. And these uh, are very different, but they both are forms of grace, which is, again, this supernatural gift from God given to us, or a help from God given to us for our salvation. Sanctifying grace, we could say, is a share in the life of God. So when we have sanctifying grace in our soul, it's as though God is there with his life. So we share in the life of God. So a sanctifying grace is a sharing in the life of God. So Almighty God looks down on, on us. Wherever he sees a soul in the state of sanctifying grace, he is pleased because he, he sees his own life in that soul. Uh, sanctified grace is also referred to as habitual grace because it remains in the soul like a habit. You know, a habit, they say, is second nature. A habit is part of us. Religious wear a garb that they call a habit. So sanctifying grace is like that. It, it stays in the soul until, or unless, it's driven out by only one thing, mortal sin. Mortal sin is the only thing that would cause one to lose this treasure of sanctifying grace. So that's why mortal sin, above all, we must avoid and, and be very much on our guard against. Actual grace is very different. Actual grace is a supernatural help from God given to us to enlighten our mind and strengthen our will to do good and to avoid evil. So it's a supernatural help from God to do good and to avoid evil. So I'm you know, kind of 
kind of condensing the definition here. Supernatural help from God given to us to enlighten our mind and strengthen our willpower. Now, we cannot save our souls of ourselves. We cannot, by ourselves, live a good life, save our immortal souls. We need God's help to do that. There was actually a heresy way back around the 5th century of a man who said that, well, I can practice virtue. I don't need God's grace to practice virtue. I can do it of myself, of my own free will, my own determination. And that was declared uh, a heresy by the church because St. Paul makes it clear, without the grace of God, we can do nothing for salvation. Oh yes, we can, we can walk and breathe and so forth and function, but even that is only by God's permission. But when we come to the supernatural life, which is the life of, of grace, we need God's help to achieve that, to, to practice virtue, to work out our salvation. We need God's help. So how do we get this actual grace is very different because sanctifying grace stays in the soul like a habit. Actual grace is something that comes and then goes. It's, it's given to us at the moment, to help us at the moment. And how do we get it? Well, first of all, there are many graces given to us by Almighty God without our even asking for them. God is good, and He gives graces. But we need more grace. We have this battle that we are involved in, which is against sin, against, as we say, the world, the flesh, and the devil, the battle against temptation, to overcome temptation, and to win that battle, we need God's help. In other words, we need actual grace. So how can we get it? We can obtain actual grace from prayer, and of course we can pray anytime, anywhere. We don't have to be in the church to pray. We can pray anytime. Prayer is speaking to God. It's, it's lifting up our heart and soul to God, asking for His help. And we need to pray, and we need to pray frequently. So we can obtain actual grace by prayer, and also by reception of the sacraments, particularly the Holy Eucharist. Receiving the body and blood of Christ in Holy Communion is an abundant source of grace. So these are primarily the two means by which we obtain actual grace to, again, help us to live a good life. Now, I want to go back. You know, actual grace is certainly very important. But I want to go back to sanctifying grace and give you what the Catechism tells us is the, well, the four effects of sanctifying grace. What does it do for the soul? What, what, what happens to the soul with sanctifying grace? And the Catechism tells us it has four effects. So sanctifying grace makes us holy and pleasing to God. I was saying earlier how Almighty God looks down into this world and He sees souls. He looks in the soul and he either sees there the life of sanctifying grace or the lack of it. And sanctifying grace pleases him. It makes us pleasing to God because he sees that share of his life in our souls. It makes us truly holy. When we have the life of sanctifying grace, we are sanctified. We are made holy. Because again, it's a share in the life of God. So that's the first effect. It makes us holy and pleasing to God. It also makes us adopted children of God. And St. Paul uh, speaks about this adoption a lot in his epistles. How God the Father, we would say, has one Son, His only begotten Son, God the Son, Jesus Christ. But by baptism, we become adopted children of God. So in that sense, we are brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. So God, you might say, adopts us into, the, into his family. Now you think about someone who is adopted. What, what does that mean? It means the parents 
they love this child, this boy or girl, they adopt this child into their family, and they treat that child as, as though it, he or she were one of their own children. And that child will then eventually share in the inheritance of the other children. So it's a wonderful thing to think that God adopts us as his children. So sanctifying grace makes us holy and pleasing to God, makes us adopted children of God, makes us temples of the Holy Ghost. Because if we think about what a church is, a church is a place where God dwells. Well, again, the soul in the state of sanctifying grace has the life of God, so it's like a temple, a dwelling, a church, a place where God dwells. So it makes us temples of the Holy Ghost, and, and this ties in with being adopted, adopted children, it gives us, sanctifying grace does this for the soul, gives us a right to heaven. So that's our inheritance, that by having the state of sanctifying grace, we have a right to heaven. Now you think about these, these benefits, these wonderful benefits, and you think about what a terrible thing it is for a person to commit a moral sin, because that person is throwing away all of these wonderful benefits. Yes, the person can recover them by a good confession, being truly repentant, going to confession, recovering the life of grace, there also is the possibility of recovering the life of grace through an act of perfect contrition. And that's something that we will talk about later when we get to the sacrament of penance, uh, contrition for sin, what do we mean by perfect contrition, etc. But again, it can be recovered. But what a tragedy when a person loses the state of sanctifying grace. And that is why it's so important for us to be so careful about um, our recreations, our entertainments, places we go to, staying away from occasions of sin, and so on and so forth, protecting that life of sanctifying grace. All right, um, switching gears here. So we talked about what the Holy Ghost does for the soul. He brings the life of grace into the soul, and he also infuses into the soul the three theological virtues and the seven gifts of the Holy Ghost. So let's talk about those briefly. What are those? Now this is a big word, theological, and it comes from two Greek, Greek words. Theos is the Greek word for God. And logos would mean word, but it, it means uh, virtues directed to God is, what, is how we would define it. So theological virtues are the three virtues that are directed to God himself as the end of those virtues. And they would be faith, hope, and charity. So let's understand what we mean by these three virtues, what would be the definition of these virtues. So faith, first of all, is the virtue by which we believe what God has revealed and his church teaches. Now, there is such, such a thing as human faith. For instance, you could watch the news or you could be told that something happened and you believe it. You didn't see it yourself, but you believe what you're told because, well, this person telling you has no reason to lie and, you know, you watch the news and they have pictures of it, etc. So you believe it. That's human faith. If, if you told me that you drove up the, the road here and a moose walked in front of your car across the road, I would believe you. Well, I've seen moose up here before, but I didn't see it myself. So that's human faith. But supernatural faith is where we believe what God has revealed. And we believe it on God's word. Now we just said before class today, the act of faith. Oh my God, I firmly believe, etc., etc. So faith is belief in what God has revealed because, as it says in the act of faith, God can neither deceive nor be deceived. And so we have that, that mental acceptance of what God has revealed. Uh, hope is the second supernatural or theological virtue. And hope is a virtue by which we trust that God will be faithful to his promises. Particularly, 
that he will give us heaven and the means to get it. God, God could not promise something and then fail to fulfill his promise because he is God. He is almighty. He is infinite. He is perfect goodness. So we have a trust in God. And finally, charity means we love God. And we love him above all things. We love God who is our creator, also our redeemer, our sanctifier, who gives us grace. And we owe him worship and love and service. So these are the three theological virtues. We're going to come, we're going to come back to them when we get into the commandments, which would be a couple classes from now. Because when we talk about the first commandment, the first commandment would include the obligation to practice these virtues. And it would forbid sins against them, like heresy would be against faith, Presumption or despair would be against hope. Uh, hatred of God, obviously a terrible, terrible sin, would be against charity, love. So, and there are other sins against the three theological virtues. But the point here is that these are infused into the soul by the Holy Ghost at baptism. And then also, there are infused into the soul, even of a baby, we call the seven gifts of the Holy Ghost. And the seven gifts are just that. They are gifts, which means they are gratuitous, gratuitously given to the soul. We don't earn them. They're given to us by Almighty God, although we can increase them. We can increase our, our possession of them. The seven gifts of the Holy Ghost are enumerated by Isaiah the prophet in the Old Testament. And they are wisdom understanding. I'm not, not going to spend a lot of time on this right now because I don't think it's, it's essential for uh, a basic catechism knowledge. We know what they are. We know the names. Wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety, and fear of the Lord. Counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety, and fear fear of the Lord, the gift of fear. Um, every year when we are preparing for the season, the Feast of Pentecost, and we have uh, uh, we have a novena, we go through and have a reading on each of these gifts. What does it mean? And we have a prayer, praying for the seven gifts. But they are given to us to strengthen us to help us to practice virtue. They're given to us by the Holy Ghost. And I'm sorry, those looking online, or some of you here might not be able to see the bottom ones because of the podium here, but I don't think that's essential. Um, we can talk about them later. Right for now, I wanted you to know what they are when you hear the term, the gifts of the Holy Ghost, and the names. So again, it's wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety, fear of the Lord. Just to give you an example of what they mean. So fortitude means strength. And that is given especially to Christians who are uh, in a situation where their faith is challenged. You read about the martyrs who were put to death, and you think, how did they have the strength to uh, refuse to sacrifice to the idols or whatever it was and to be put to death? God gave them, the Holy Ghost strengthened them with this gift of fortitude. And the same with the others. So these are uh, tremendous powers. Uh, the gifts of the Holy Ghost are like supernatural powers that are given to us to help us. So we use the gifts with actual grace and the virtues, and then we practice what we call the moral virtues. We also practice the theological virtues. But there are two kinds of virtues. There are the three theological virtues, which are faith, hope, and charity, which uh, have, again, God as their ultimate end. Belief in God, trust in God, love of God. So the three theological virtues. And then the other virtues would be called the moral virtues, which would be the virtues that govern our moral life. Moral life meaning what is right and what is wrong and practicing 
the right things, practicing virtue, as we would say. Now, the moral virtues, there are four chief moral virtues, and they are um, prudence, justice, Uh, temperance, um, or am I missing? <laughs> uh, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. I'm, age is catching up with me here. Um, prudence, uh, prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. Fortitude. Well, erase that. Fortitude. I put them in the order it gives. Fortitude and temperance. So these are the chief moral virtues. So we call them the cardinal virtues because the word cardinal comes from a Latin word for a hinge, like a hinge on a door. And you have the hinges on the door and the door swings and those hinges support it. So these four chief moral virtues support the whole moral life. But under the category of any one of them, there are other virtues. So we would say like justice, for example, under the category of justice, would be the virtue of obedience, would be the virtue of religion, giving worship to God. That comes under justice, because justice means giving to a person what is his due. Prudence would deal with making the right decisions. Fortitude, again, is strength, and differentiating this fortitude from the gift of fortitude. So the gift of fortitude strengthens one, gives one the power, the strength, to be able to practice his faith, and the virtue of fortitude would be that person making use of the gift and then actually standing up for his faith, being strong in the faith. Temperance, very important, controlling our bodily inclinations. So we think of temperance, we usually think of food and drink, moderation, but it, it governs many other, many other aspects of the spiritual life. So that would be then the um, virtues uh, discussion of the um, moral virtues and the theological virtues. So I think I want to go, I wasn't sure how long this would take us. So yes, I would like to go into the next section and that is on the Catholic Church. Um, matter of fact, I'm going to read one little question and answer from the Catechism here. And it says at the end of this lesson on the Holy Ghost and the gifts and the virtues, it says, what are some other moral virtues? Some other moral virtues are po filial piety and patriotism, which disposes us, disposes us to honor, love, and respect our parents and our country. Obedience, which disposes us to do the will of our superiors. Veracity, veracity, which disposes us to tell the truth. Truthfulness. Uh, liberality, which disposes us rightly to use worldly goods, material goods. Liberality, not the same as liberalism, but... but uh, the opposite of being um, covetous and, uh, you know, hard-hearted and so forth. Uh, the next one, patience, which disposes us to bear up under trials and difficulties. Humility, which disposes us to acknowledge our limitations. Chastity or purity, which disposes us to be pure in soul and body. Besides these, there are many other moral virtues. So... That's a brief discussion of virtues, and we want to move on now to another section. We have a little more time left today, and we want to talk about the Catholic Church. So we say in the Apostles' Creed, I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, etc. So what do we mean by the Holy Catholic Church? The word church is used for a couple different things. Sometimes we talk about a church building. We look at a building that has been erected to, in which the mass is offered and people go to attend mass, receive the sacraments to worship Almighty God and say, that's a church. But here we're talking about the body, the union of all the believers. So for one to become a member of the Catholic Church, First of all, he must be baptized. That's how one enters into the church. So we have a baptism of a baby. That baby now becomes a member of the church. 
or an adult received into the church. So we have to be baptized. <coughs> Second, to profess the faith. And that would mean the entire faith. You couldn't have someone that would be considered a member of the church who would just accept some things and reject others. Um, before our Lord ascended into heaven, as recorded by St. Mark, he said to his apostles, Go forth into the whole world, teach all nations all that I have commanded you. He that is baptized and believes shall be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. So that's an essential part for being a member of the Catholic Church. Uh, being, being baptized, believing all the church teaches, and being united to the other members of the church under the authority that God gave his church. So in normal times you have a pope, and someone who would be separated from the pope would be outside the church, even though he believes the other doctrines. Um, so united in this body. Let me read to you the definition from the catechism. The church is the congregation. So congregation, union, body of the faithful. The church is the congregation of all baptized persons united in the same true faith, the same sacrifice, and the same sacraments under the authority of the sovereign pontiffs and the bishops in communion with him. So, they profess the same faith, the same sacrifice, which is referring to the Mass, and sacraments. So, they're united with these things. Now, obviously, we have a very difficult situation today, where there is a man in Rome who claims to be Pope. Most of the people in the world think he's the Pope, the Vicar of Christ, the representative of Christ on Earth the successor of St. Peter, but he's a heretic. And there's no way he could be the visible head of the Catholic Church. He's not even a member. He's outside the church by his heresy. And we will talk about that because we need to understand the situation today. But this is what makes someone a member of the church. And Christ founded the church. Jesus Christ founded the church. He said to St. Peter, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. My church. I will build my church. So Christ founded the church. The apostles were the first bishops. He gave them the mission or the command to go forth and teach all the things that he had himself taught them. And they were sustained. We talked about Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Ghost. We say that the Holy Ghost is the soul of the church. Because the Holy Ghost is the source of life, of grace, in the church, operating through the sacraments, etc., by grace. Now, Christ founded one church. And, of course, we know that that's the Catholic Church. But how would you tell someone else who's not a Catholic and is searching for the truth, you know, I just read, going through my emails this morning, a man from Turkey, and in fact, he lives in Tarsus. You know, St. Paul was from the city of Tarsus. And he uh, was raised a Muslim. He met a Catholic when he joined the military. Not many Catholics in Turkey, but this man that he met was a Novus Ordo Catholic. But at any rate, he began to study, became convinced of the truth of the Catholic religion. He already had his doubts about the Muslim religion, but that's what he was raised in. So he realized the Catholic Church was the true church. He kept studying, praying, searching, and then he realized that traditional Catholic Catholicism is true Catholicism. And he's just, you know, the whole nine yards. It's just amazing. This gets back to the Holy Ghost, the grace of the Holy Ghost guiding and leading people. But let's say you had someone like that who came to you and said, you know, I'm looking for the truth, I want to find the truth, but I'm confused, or I don't know, how do I know which is the true church? Well, what would you tell them? Of course we would tell them that, well, the Catholic Church is the church Christ founded, but how would you prove it? How can we prove that the Catholic Church is the one Christ founded? 
by two arguments, primarily. Uh, the first argument I would use is the historical argument. And by that I mean, if you trace back the history of the church, you go back to the 1950s and you had the Pope was Pope Pius XII. And you had Catholics all over the world and there were churches everywhere and schools and convents and monasteries and all these Catholic works, etc. And you admire this this beauty of the Catholic Church and founding hospitals and orphanages and all of these works of charity and so forth. And then you look back in history and you can trace that church back through all of the trials it has been through to the time of Christ. But if I look at the Lutheran Church, I can only go back to the time of Martin Luther or the Anglican Church back to the time of King Henry VIII and Cranmer or uh, the Muslim Church if it were religion, I don't know they call it a church, but the Muslim religion, Islam, that goes back to Mohammed, who lived in what, the 500, 600, 700s, I guess. You know, it's had a, had a beginning. So all of these different religions began, it's the only one that you can trace back to the apostles and to Christ himself would be the Roman Catholic Church. Um, and I should add that here. The, the name of the Catholic Church is the Roman Catholic Church because St. Peter went to Rome and there he established his seat of authority. And so we are Roman Catholics. Now, we, we talked about this historical argument. The other argument would be the four marks. And that's what I'm going to speak about in a minute. But there is another this is really tied in with the four marks, and that would be miracles. I mean, there's so many things we could talk about. There's the um, wonderful reality of the incorruptible saints that only the Catholic Church has. There are, for instance, the healings that have taken place in Lourdes in France over the last 200 years since Our Lady appeared there. There have been saints in the Catholic Church. There's no other religion that calls their former members saints, so there might be a couple, but, but there's no other church that has the saints, as the Catholic Church has done, men and women whose lives were so extraordinary that even those outside the church acknowledge they were saintly, they were saints. And the holiness of their lives was testified to by God himself by the miracles that they worked or have been worked through invoking them. So those are some of the ways by which we could prove that the Roman Catholic Church is this church that Christ founded. But I want to speak about, in particular, the what we call the four marks. So the four marks are four uh, distinguishable signs by which you could recognize the church that is the one Christ founded. We say the Catholic Church is one holy Catholic and apostolic. Now, what we mean by that is the true Church of Christ have to has, has to have these four characteristics. First of all, it has unity. Unity in faith, unity in worship, unity in practice, etc. So, th the same Mass everywhere in the world. You could travel, you know, before Vatican II came along, you could go anywhere and go into a Catholic Church and the Mass would be the same. The sacraments would be the same. I've, I've been told this by many individuals who were maybe in the military, like one elderly man who was in the Navy after World War II, and he's stationed on a ship in the Mediterranean, and the ship would dock in Spain, Barcelona maybe, and he would go into a Catholic church to attend Mass. Couldn't understand the sermon at all, but the Mass was exactly the same as in his parish at home. Then the ship docks in Marseille, France, and the Mass is in French, not the Mass, the, the sermon is in French, but the Mass is the same. Then he docks in, you know, Rome or somewhere in Italy, and again, the Mass was always the same. So there's that unity. Another aspect of unity <clears throat> is that the Catholic Church teaches the same truths on faith and morals. So it used to be you could go into a Roman Catholic church in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, or Spokane, Washington, or whatever, and ask a priest, 
a question on morals. Is artificial birth control lawful or not? You would get the clear answer. It's sinful, forbidden by God. You could go to another priest on the other side of the country. You could go to another country and ask a priest, and you get the same answer, because there was that unity. Nowadays, you could go to different so-called Catholic churches in the same city and get as many different answers from as many priests as you talk about. I was just reading how this Jesuit priest came out, and he's, uh, you know, this was on the Novus Ordo Watch website, the highly respected, maybe that's not the term, but important or significant priest who's like an author or whatever, came out and said he doesn't believe in the presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And so, and that's common nowadays. So you don't see in the modern Catholic Church, you don't see the unity in doctrine on faith and morals that has always been a hallmark of the church. And we know that Christ's church has to have this oneness because our Lord himself often spoke against error. Uh, for instance, even St. Peter, on one occasion, he did it uh, in ignorance. He did it out of his love for our Lord. Our Lord was talking about how he was going to be crucified. And St. Peter said, Lord, far be it from thee that these things should happen to thee. And Jesus said, Get behind me, Satan. For thou art a scandal to me. Thou art a contradictory, a contradiction to me, etc. So our Lord would brook no uh, error. And he said that his uh, sheepfold would be one. There shall be one flock and one shepherd, etc. So the Catholic Church has this mark of unity. It also has the mark of holiness. Now, this is important to understand. Because sometimes non-Catholics might think that we're saying, we're all holy, and you're not. You know, we're, we're holy. Well, the Catholic Church is holy. And therefore, because the Church is holy, it has the teachings which, if lived, lead to holiness. And it has the means of grace, the sacraments, which earn grace to live a holy life. And... The church has produced holy members in every age, down through the centuries. We talked about the saints. You can read their lives. The church has produced these holy members. Even in times of great error and social strife and war and whatever, the church has produced holy members because the church herself is holy. But it doesn't mean that because we're members of the church, we're automatically holy. We have to work at it. And I like to use this example that our Lord himself used. Our Lord referred to his church oftentimes as the kingdom of God on earth. So the, the kingdom of God is like a net lowered into the sea. And the net gathers together all kinds of fish, both good and bad. And the fishermen pull the net out on the shore and they sort the fish. They throw away the bad and they keep the good. Now, I would ask you this. Is there something wrong with the net because it gathered in bad fish? You know, there's the kind of fish, the bottom fish that nobody wants to eat, that maybe aren't, aren't good for eating, and the fishermen throw them away, use them for fertilizer or something, um, but they don't want to eat them. You wouldn't say that, that that's a bad net. It, it gathered in bad fish because the net is just lowered in the way they would fish back in those days and, and brings up any fish that are in, in the, uh, the course of the net that's drawn up. So the net is a good net. And that's why our Lord said the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God on earth, his church, is like a net lowered into the sea. There are bad members of the church. We don't have it made because we are members of the Catholic Church. We have to do our part. We have to work out our salvation, as St. Paul puts it. We have to receive the sacraments. We have to live the commandments. We have to pray. And we have to, to persevere in that. But the church herself is holy. Again, has the means of holiness, the teachings, and has produced holy members in every age. When we say Catholic here, we're not meaning exactly the same as when we say the Roman Catholic Church. Here, we're saying that the church that Christ founded is Catholic. That is a Greek uh, word, katholikos, it's a Greek word that means universal. And what that means is the church that Christ founded is for 
anyone, it doesn't matter what race, what country, what ethnic background, what language, um, uh, what, what intelligence level, anyone who wants to become a member of the Catholic Church is, may do so. It's universal. It's for everyone. Did you know the Mormon Church, when it was first founded by Joseph Smith, did not accept uh, black people, you know, African American or Negroes, would not accept them as members of the church. So it was, it was restricting its membership. So that's what we mean here by this word, is that it's for, it wasn't just for a particular race. In the Old Testament, you know, the Jewish people, the Israelites, kept to themselves. And they didn't go out and try to convert others, uh, although there were other, some others that were converted. But they, were, um, they kept alive the promise of the Messiah. They kept to themselves. The Roman Catholic Church, Christ said, when he established his church, or when he commissioned the apostles, go forth and teach all nations. So he wants everyone to join his church. So the true church of Christ must be universal. But that also kind of includes the sense of unity. Because it has to be the same everywhere. And that's one of the problems with the modern so-called Catholic Church. And finally, the church is apostolic, meaning that it goes back to, it can trace, can trace its story, its history, back to the 12 apostles and uh, on whom Christ established the church. So that's going to wrap it up for today. That's a brief discussion of the Roman Catholic Church. I want to continue with that in our next class, and we're going to talk about the situation with the papacy today, and the proper understanding of the papacy, and a few more other aspects about the church, and then we will move on to um, uh, the final parts of the Apostles' Creed. Without a true pope. Before our times? Yeah, I two, mean, how many two, years? Two about? years and, and... How many? Two years and eight months. Like a little less than three years. What? Well, what we have today is totally unprecedented. Oh, in the oh. history of the church, there's never been a period like this long. Like it is long. now, right. because it's Correct. been more than. Correct. Oh.